welcome again to the great audience uh, through Zoom. Uh, we had already a first part of our session talking about the strengths of soft power diplomacy. And now, um, as I told you before, I invited a very distinguished panelist to talk about the importance and the strengths or the changes of soft power um, during the pandemic. So I would say uh, the pre-COVID, the during COVID and the after COVID period. Uh, first, uh, we will have uh, some thoughts uh, from the permanent representative of Qatar, my dear friend, Ambassador Altani uh, from New York, but because in New York it's 4 p.m., we asked her to send a message, so it will be a video message. And actually, she will be talking about the experience of using soft power diplomacy during the pandemic and uh, how is it related to multilateral diplomacy as well. As I told you, um, the ambassador herself is very experienced, not only as an ambassador in the United Nations, running a lot of discussions, um, but also because she has been uh, instrumental setting up the education system uh, and development in Qatar. Uh, after that, uh, I see uh, on the Zoom, uh, Mark Donfried, who is a legendary uh, person of culture diplomacy of the world. I see he's driving. Uh, do I see it well, Mark? You are driving a car. Now you see, this is a new format of diplomacy <laughs> and lecturing. Uh, he, he is himself a New Yorker. Uh, and set up the Institute for Culture Diplomacy in Berlin in 1999. And then it, he, he created something huge because now it's a worldwide uh, recognized and influential organization. It has got the Academy of Culture Diplomacy as well. And I asked him to join us and also to, to share with us his experiences as representing the institution, looking around in the world. Um, how do we use soft power diplomacy uh, during COVID and after COVID? We will have different experiences shared with you today from the Balkan, uh, from, uh, from Qatar, from the American European perspective. Uh, and uh, let's just start now with um, the video message uh, of Shaika Aliya Bint Ahmed Al Thani, who is the permanent representative of Qatar at the United Nations. So Alia has the floor now. It is my pleasure and privilege to address you today at the Voice. 26th International Summer University because again, please, we by the hear. Institute of Advanced Studies in cooperation with the Institute of Social and Let's Economy start it Studies, again, could we? The University of Pannonia and Campus and the UNESCO Chair in Cultural Heritage and Sustainability. I thank you all for this invitation. I will make a few remarks on the use of soft power in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. First, the COVID-19 pandemic has showed why we need multilateralism, social solidarity, and the global cooperation more than ever. Transnational threats require solidarity and multi-stakeholder forms of global cl collaboration among governments, civil society, and the private sector. No nation, no matter how large or how powerful it is, can alone address pandemics, climate change, cybercrime, inequality, education and health for all, among others. We are all in this together. Even though the pandemic has changed the world, it also provided us an opportunity to come together as a global community for peaceful cooperation that extends beyond this crisis. We need, however, new tools, ideas, initiatives, and partnerships. We have seen over the past year the enormous solidarity among people worldwide and how innovative kinds of public-private partnerships have managed to respond to the virus socioeconomic impact, development of vaccines, among so many others. Moving forward, such partnerships can spur innovative innovations through new technologies and by promoting decent jobs, wealth creation opportunities and equity. The COVID-19 pandemic has given the private sector and citizens an immense voice in the creation of soft power. The production um, and equitable distribution of vaccines, global vaccine rollouts, are one of the most powerful tools of soft power today. 
If wealthy countries do not aid in worldwide vaccine distribution, they could miss an opportunity not only to combat the pandemic today, but also to share future responses to public health crisis. Undoubtedly, the pandemic has made foreign aid a more, more of a public tool. Small states have been at the forefront of global solidarity, working together to overcome the pandemic and calling for building back better and greener. I'm proud to note that the state of Qatar has been at the forefront of global efforts. Qatar supported COVAX facility and multilateral efforts to ensure fair and equitable access to vaccines. We contributed $20 million to the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization and $10 million to the World Health Organization and supported the humanitarian initiative to raise $100 million to provide vaccines worldwide. Qatar has called for the vaccine not only to be to be treated as a social and public good, but the priority access should be given to the most vulnerable countries. Qatar is a small country, but our impact comes from our country's culture, development, co cooperation, policies, and more. It comes from our genuine concern with our brothers and sisters in the least developed countries, landlocked countries, and small island states. As the pandemic and climate change are affecting these countries, with devastating impacts on human health, economies, education, and other sectors. Qatar also believes that culture, sports, quality education for all, and women's empowerment have the power to inspire hope for a better tomorrow. They play a constructive and key role in bringing people and cultures together. As we celebrate our differences, we should be united as human beings in our desire for a more peaceful, prosperous, and tolerant world. Qatar is committed to supporting the UN system in advancing global security, justice, building back better and greener, and implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, whether through international humanitarian assistance, expanding education for all, youth employment, tackling terrorism and violent extremism, fighting trafficking in persons, mediating conflicts, and contributing to varied inclusive peace efforts. Our support the, re the resilience and adaptation efforts of developing countries. I will stop here and wish you a very successful discu discussion and thank you again for the opportunity to be part of this dialogue. So thank you very much. That was a, a kind of um, opening thoughts uh, coming from Qatar. And as you saw and heard, it was very influential the way the ambassador talked about the role of Qatar, which is very strongly related to the power of soft power diplomacy. During the pandemic, Qatar has contributed very strongly in the surrounding countries, in the during, uh, throughout the most vulnerable countries, uh, in the small island states, uh, with a great support system, helping really uh, people vaccinated. And um, uh, as she said, uh, Qatar as a small country, but a very influential country, has been using education, culture, uh, so different tools of soft power diplomacy to build up the image about the country. And now I'm turning to my good friend, Mark Donfried, the director, a funding director of the Institute of Culture Diplomacy in Berlin. I don't know whether she is, he is in Berlin. Uh, he's a New Yorker uh, running the Institute in Berlin um, and uh, dealing actually with the whole world. So Mark, my question is really to you that um, how do you see during the pandemic, what uh, has become the role or the new tools of soft power diplomacy and how do you see the, the, the continuation of that? Welcome to our Institute. Thank you so much. And I apologize, I'm in the car, but I actually have to go to a brief meeting in Hamburg. So I'm actually in Hamburg <laughs> right now. But I'd like to share with you a few reflections that hopefully will be useful uh, as we consider what the use of cultural diplomacy can be 
in the current situation and also in the, the coming situation, whether it's a post-COVID environment or some would say actually COVID will not go away. So let's say the, the, the situation with COVID. And I wanted to begin by referring to actually a French philosopher, Restif de la Breton. Uh, he wrote around the time of the conclusion of the French Revolution. And there his thesis was that human beings after the French Revolution were actually the same as human beings before the French Revolution, made of the same molecules, the same chemicals, etc. And this idea that they were somehow more civilized was actually a myth. And his thesis was summarized by saying people or human beings need to get sick in order to appreciate good health, just like we have to also have periods of war to be grateful for peace. Now, I very much hope he's wrong, and I think uh, one testament, maybe it's uh, proving that he's wrong, is actually the corona crisis. Uh, what was, for me, very encouraging with the COVID uh, situation is the uh, observation that actually human beings can change, and they can actually change immediately in serious ways. Who would have thought that the entire world would actually suddenly be wearing masks like that? Uh, and for me, that very small change of habit, so to speak, uh, of the social distancing of the masks is actually a very big deal uh, because it shows me that actually human beings can change and we can actually all sing with one voice, so to speak. So for me, I look at this period of the COVID crisis actually with optimism because it actually shows us uh, that actually change is possible. Uh, but let me come back to cultural diplomacy for a moment uh, since I I, as the, the founder and the creator of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, we do give a lot of thought uh, to what was cultural diplomacy, what is cultural diplomacy, and how it's evolving. Now, I would summarize the, the main definition of cultural diplomacy in two categories. I would say cultural diplomacy, you could look at the classical sense and the modern sense. For us at the Institute, classical cultural diplomacy would be examples that were referred to already this morning. Things like the British Council, the Alliance Francaise, the Goethe Institute, really where governments were trying to quote unquote, win the hearts and minds of foreign audiences. The idea was attraction, persuasion, uh, as you also referred to Ambassador Bogai, uh, Professor Joseph Nye, soft power uh, as opposed to hard power or smart power uh, as uh, Barack Obama and the Secretary of State Clinton would always refer to. Um, I think uh, the more modern form of cultural diplomacy, however, we would define in a simple way with six words. Cultural diplomacy today would be how do we educate, enhance, and sustain relationships with the goal of building dialogue, understanding, and trust. And that's, I think, the main contribution that cultural diplomacy can offer us today, to build trust between relationships. Uh, at the Institute, we look at actually examples, as was mentioned also earlier today, from the private sector, from the public sector, and from civil society. We would also look at applications in three different kinds of relationships. Peaceful relations, where the countries want to work together and are at peace. Conflict zones, where the countries don't necessarily want to work together and are maybe having a conflict or some sort of a war. As well as also post-conflict situations. Let's say Rwanda or South Africa, where it's not only a question of building trust, but also fostering reconciliation after a conflict has taken place. So, so those were some of the thoughts that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, I think really the main contribution cultural diplomacy can offer us today is actually this idea of fostering trust. And I think that's so important at a time where you see really extremism almost in every sense, uh, where you have uh, the rise of radical parties in a variety of countries around the world, uh, where you have uh, propagation of many myths, uh, many, uh, let's say, uh, exaggerations uh, when it comes to ideas, what are Germans like, uh, what are, uh, excuse me one second here, uh, what are uh, Americans uh, like, etc. Even looking at my own country, uh, this idea of Republicans and Democrats really being divided. Uh, it's so unfortunate in the United States that you really don't have discussion, you don't have debate. Uh, one party is against the other party and blocks them no matter what. Uh, and those sorts of environments make it very difficult, of course, to, to foster trust. So to summarize, I would say cultural diplomacy has actually increased in importance uh, in the current situation of COVID uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, but in general, as we see more and more fragmentation in the global situation at the micro and macro level, whether it's Republicans and Democrats in the USA, whether it's Brexit in the UK, or really looking at even institutions such as the European Union, uh, which we all sort of, sort of took for granted, uh, although we see it's actually not so uh, not so evident. Uh, and actually, the we all need to water the flowers, so to speak, if the flowers are going to grow. Uh, but let me stop there with my reflections, uh, and I'd like to hand it over to the other uh, experts uh, on the panel, and then perhaps in the question and answer, we can go deeper in, in certain issues, depending on the interest of the, of the audience. But thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Mark. I'm very happy that you nearly, I mean, sometimes stopped as well, because, you know, we were not sure where, where you, you were. You are still online? Mark? Is he? Yes, I'm still, I'm still yeah, because yes. I, yeah, yes. No, no, because yes. I just have a very quick question to you, if, please, if you can please. answer. Because please. I think that that was very important, and I saw already uh, in the chat box that it's always a big question how soft power, cultured power of diplomacy is used in as a tool of preventive diplomacy. Because you were talking uh, the importance of trust building, of course, the classical ways, we, we have talked all about that. But I, I, I like to use it the more we can and the often we can as a tool for preventive diplomacy because you talked also about the conflict zone. So what, what do you think about that? You know, what are the possibilities here? As so a, yes, in terms of... Sure. In terms of conflict zones, we've observed a number of strategies for cultural diplomacy that can be quite effective. Looking at examples like Israel, Palestine, South Africa, Rwanda. Uh, one example I always classify it as what I call indirect cultural diplomacy. So the idea is not to t tell people about American culture or to bring American artists or to bring American music, but to have some sort of a common activity where we come together. And one of the most powerful examples of that is actually soccer or even sports in general. Let's come together and play on the same team. It doesn't matter what passport you have. It doesn't matter what religion you have. It doesn't even matter what language you speak. Let's have this common activity. And there are very interesting examples where that has really worked uh, in very extreme conflict zones, such as Israel-Palestine, where much of the world has given up. They think, okay, there's no solution. They actually prove it is possible. We're looking at examples like Daniel Barenboim uh, with the East-West Divan Orchestra. Uh, you know, let's perform okay. at the highest level beautiful music together. Uh, so that would be my immediate recommendation for when there's a conflict zone. Try to have indirect culture diplomacy bring those individuals together for some other reason. Uh, another very effective way, if you look at examples like the Peace Corps and other volunteer organizations, is volunteering together. Let's build a homeless shelter together. Uh, and when we're holding the power tools and the screwdriver and the, the power drill, uh, it doesn't matter so much what's on your business card <laughs> or what's on your passport. Uh, and that can also really allow for you know, exchanges to take place uh, that very often wouldn't take place in a normal setting. So that would be a sort of a, a quick contribution. So what, what could be an effective strategy when there's a conflict zone? Thank you very much, Mark. My, my main concern, do, are we going to be able to build back better or is it just a slogan again? I mean, after the COVID time, are we, are we capable of uh, learning from the situation before? You know, how are we developing our ways in the post-COVID area? And I'm happy that you see in a coffee how is it is safer now for you. Thank you. So, uh, excellent. No, uh, so to answer your question, I'm optimistic there. Uh, as we look at the way in which the world has reacted to COVID, as I said earlier, that gives me optimism. We, we can change. We can change dramatically uh, and we can change really in unison. So my hope is that really humanity will take lessons learned and say, okay, if it's possible here, what about with the issues for the environment, for example, uh, in terms of lifestyles? You know, is it necessary to go to the office every day? Or maybe we can do you know, two days a week home office. And many sort of systematic changes are there. There. Cultural diplomacy, of course, immediately uh, changed. The fact that we're doing this uh, meeting now via Zoom is one example of that. We were forced uh, at the ICD Academy. We have about 200 students on average there for MA, MBA, PhD. We immediately were forced to go online. Before Corona, uh, our university partners were hesitant. Uh, and of course, everyone prefers really in live sessions where the students are there, of course, is always better. But the university was hesitant to go online. Uh, then when we were forced to, we did it. Uh, and then after Corona, it was actually a few months ago, I was talking to the rector of the university. Okay, what about now offering a truly 100% online degree? And now suddenly they're taking it very seriously. Most likely we'll offer it already this fall. So to answer your question, I think since we were forced with Corona to make a lot of fundamental changes, uh, that's making it easier for us uh, to now make other changes. So there I am optimistic. We already have changed. Cultural diplomacy has changed. University of education has changed. Uh, and really every aspect of life will change whether it's foreign policy, whether it's health, et cetera. So therefore, we're just beginning to see the peak of the iceberg there. Uh, the priorities will change. Security risks will change. Suddenly, we learned you can have the biggest military in the world. It's not going to help you against something like corona. Uh, and unfortunately, that's a lesson that terrorists have learned, uh, to see the vulnerability of situations. And hopefully, it won't come to whether it's biological warfare, et cetera. Uh, but of course, also, the countries have also learned. Uh, how do we prepare ourselves? How do we respond? And we need to think much more creatively now than we were before. 
So just as a brief answer, I am optimistic and we've already seen the changes uh, having started. And I think uh, actually uh, the, the, the diplomatic use of sports, so sports diplomacy has been very influential all over the world. And um, we actually have um, um, in the Olympic movements, the, the, the Fair Play Award, which, uh, which um, has been awarded to many people who have done a lot through sports diplomacy uh, for creating these, these healthy environments. So actually, the way the clubs are handling the situation, this is really the diplomacy, because uh, frankly, the way people are behaving, this is not diplomacy. I mean, you know, they are behaving as they are behaving. The question is, what are the standpoints and the actions or the reactions to these situations of the clubs? or of the international organization or the Olympic movement, and that's diplomacy. And I think that is very strongly used. And Mark, are you with us? Do you have something to say about sports diplomacy? Sure, well, there's actually many examples one could draw from the field of sports. And I think the first example that I mentioned earlier is this idea of indirect cultural diplomacy. That through sports, you have the ability through a common activity to bring individuals together who normally wouldn't come together. And I think the benefit of that is to force people to challenge stereotypes. If I grew up my entire life and someone tells me Muslims are like this or Jews are like that, okay. Uh, there's a German saying, uh, der, der, nix weiß, muss alles glauben. Uh, he who doesn't know has to believe everything. And I think that's very much the problem that we see in the United States around Europe with the rise of national parties, this idea of provincialism. So we have to make it more difficult for individuals to make generalizations. That's one of the of cultural diplomacy. The more cultural diplomacy there is, the more exchange there is, the more education it is, the harder it will be for me to convince you that this group is like that or this group is like that. And that's one of the wonderful powerful elements of sports as cultural diplomacy, that through the soccer ball, you can bring these individuals together and they can say, hey, wait a minute, maybe it is possible to work with the other side. You know, if we can play soccer together, maybe we can do other things together. Or as I mentioned, Daniel Barrymore, if we can perform the highest level beautiful music together, then maybe what they're saying is not true, that this group is entirely like this or this group is entirely like that. So what, what I like about sports is the fact that it really does uh, force individuals to rethink stereotypes uh, by having mixed teams. Of course, if it's Israel against Palestine, that could cause more problems. Uh, but if you have a mixed team, some of the Israelis and Palestinians playing on the same team, that's the idea. And there's many examples, for example, rights to play is one of the big organizations also linked to the United Nations doing this kind of work every day in complex zones. Secondly, with sports, what's interesting, you can also move uh, in the direction of greater human rights and civil rights. Uh, this organization, Rights to Play, for example, has done very interesting work in Africa, in particular, empowering women. Uh, in some communities in Africa, they'll go where typically women don't participate in sports traditions. And they will create opportunities for sports education, also after school sports, uh, which has very powerful repercussions, not always welcome. Some, some individuals, of course, in these cultures don't welcome this because it's really changing rules, changing traditions and customs. Uh, but it has been a very effective way of women empowerment. Uh, there's also great examples in Saudi Arabia of women who have done wonderful things uh, in the field of sports, creating the first uh, soccer team, the first um, sports team. Uh, one of the women who did that is now the advisor to the Minister of Sports in the government. Uh, so even in a situation like Saudi Arabia, you see amazing uh, pathways that are open through sports, uh, not only, as I said, for breaking stereotypes, but also even empowering groups such as women. Those yeah. are a few examples. I would like really to thank uh, all the panelists joining us this morning and uh, the people here in the room and uh, all over the world. And I would like to uh, finish with the uh, thought and actually a of an action of a very strong cultural diplomatic event. And that goes uh, back to uh, Hungarian conductor Sergei Okszolti, who set up the World Orchestra for Peace uh, for the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. And uh, his motto, uh, his message was that let's show politicians what is real international collaboration. So with this thought, I would like to thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for being part of I Ask. Bye.